purpose here is to uh, introduce the Broken Science Initiative. I, uh, Emily Kaplan is my partner in that effort, and, uh, and uh, Clark Reed as well. Um, the, uh, the, uh, in an announcing it, I would expect to be asked, uh, what's an initiative, what is the initiative, and uh, what science is broken, and what manner is it broken? And I think we can do that quickly and kind of simply here. At least that's going to be the effort. Um, let's just start with the initiative. It's to explore and discuss broken science and commit resources to that. I think that in this age, that is of particular importance in that um, uh, we have uh, are currently surrendering freedoms uh, to uh, the to tyrants that are using a broken science is the, is the primary tool to, to erode rights. Um, and what it is that's broken, this is simple. Uh, in, in fact, the, the hope and the initiative is that we'd like to free, tier, free people from the tyranny of broken science and the, and the tyrants that use it. And I think that can readily be done. Um, what I mean by broken is I'm talking about the science that won't replicate. And this is a university science. It's not a problem with industry. This isn't a problem that Elon has. It is a problem that Stanford has. And there's, I want to call your attention to a paper, Most Research Findings Are False. Uh, it was written by John Ioannidis at Stanford. He's a, an esteemed medical researcher in the Department of Mathematics, uh, Public Health, Infectious Disease. And, uh, and the title pretty much says the thing here, most research findings are false, meaning they won't replicate. Um, it sounds to me like about half or, or, or more maybe, uh, at least half. But there's another important bit of research that's, that's critical here. And uh, Begley and Ellis, um, Ellis is from uh, UT Southwestern in Dallas, and Glenn Begley was a director of uh, of research at Amgen, and the two of them, on a, on a funded by Amgen, uh, spent a billion dollars and took 10 years, took a decade, and they examined 53 preclinical uh, studies in preclinical oncology and hematology. And these are, these are studies on which the drug trials were based, and Begley had noticed a poor uh, track record in getting drugs through successfully through clinical trials. And so they became suspicious of the underlying science and attempted to replicate these 53 studies and found that only 11% of them would replicate. And that's, that's horrific. We still don't know uh, what won't replicate and what will. And one of the studies that didn't replicate, I understand, has been cited several thousand times more. And so you have good reason to question what the bedrock of oncology and hematology is. Um, the fields of sociology, economics, psychology, and medicine, unfortunately, one of our friends says it's all of the ologies and medicine uh, suffer from this, this replication crisis. And, and to point out how it broke, where it broke, and who broke it, I think we first need to look at what science should be um, and how it is practiced in, in industry, away from academia. It's got different characteristics. So let's take a look at that. I've got five facets of modern science, and uh, they're kind of, kind of fun. And if you, if you hold on to this and pay attention and think about it, it jives well with common sense. Um, it, it intuits nicely. I got these from uh, a work, Evolution in Science, that my father had put together, Jeff Glassman, when uh, after uh, retiring from a director of, uh, he was head of research, internal research and development at Hughes Aircraft Company. But this is how it goes. This is what modern science is. One, it's repository and source of, of objective knowledge. Repository and source of objective knowledge. Two. This knowledge is siloed in models, okay? And what a model does is it maps a current fact to a future unrealized fact as a prediction. And validation comes through predictive power, solely through predictive power. There's no other, there's no other road to validation. And in fact, the models come in four flavors. There's conjecture, hypothesis, theory, and law. 
and those have been well delineated in terms of their uh, predictive strength. And number five, uh, validation is independent of method. And that's a critical point. Uh, the, the, there isn't a method that guarantees an outcome that replicates. Um, and the, the deal is, is whether the theory comes from, from uh, inspiration or perspiration, its validation comes solely through its predictive power. And so these are the five facets that are, that are critical to, to modern science. And I wanna just share some thoughts, some notes, maybe even slight editorial on each of these. Um, I've got five concepts related to that I wanna share. A predictive power is evidence for science's objectivity, sole source of its reliability, and the demarcation between science and pseudoscience. And I could have just as easily said science and non-science, and, and non um, but uh, I picked pseudoscience because that's what Karl Popper did. And uh, I've got, we have a bone to pick with his approach. But the demarcation's important here. The thing that separates astronomy from astrology is that astronomy has, has predictive power. And so if someone says that there's going to be a, a, uh, uh, an eclipse in 215 days and four hours, and it happens, that's the kind of thing you see in astronomy. Um, astrology has a little harder time with uh, Aries are happier and make better lovers. That's a little different kind of thing where you may not be able to show any predictive power. Uh, B, predictive power is determinant of a scientific model's validity, provides the basis for for any rational trust of science. And so and there aren't reasons outside of that. Um, mapping a fact to a future fact as a prediction is an inductive argument where the first fact constitutes premises and the second fact forms the conclusion. And so here we are, we're clearly in the space of induction. And D, induction arrives at conclusions with probability and not certainty. You'll see other definitions uh, or, or, or d distinctions, demarcations from indu induction and deduction. I saw this one in Scientific American 25 or 30 years ago from Martin Gardner, and I thought it was spot on. It sheds light. You can get confused sometimes, not in the difference between induction and deduction, but what the significance of induction is. And this is uh, uh, looking for universals from particulars and all that. I don't find that particularly illuminating, but the idea that its conclusions come with probability and not certainty is, is a wonderful demarcation between in induction and deduction. Um, e, all scientific knowledge is therefore the fruit of induction validated by predictive power, which is a measure of probability. It's worth saying again. All scientific knowledge is therefore the fruit of induction validated by predictive power, which is a measure of probability. And I have a quote here from Laplace, uh, probability theory is the calculus of inductive reasoning, okay? So the whole thing, with the key to all of what we're doing here in modern science, it has to do with prediction. It has to do with prediction. That is the de demarcation. Now what's happened, and we know where and who and when, the process, the mess kind of starts in 1934 with Karl Popper. Um, I don't like to talk about Popper, Kuhn, Lakatos, and Feyerabend without talking about the Australian philosopher David Stove. He dedicated his entire philosophical career, the span of it, to correcting the errors that were made by these guys. And there are many of us that think he did an absolutely amazing job of that. It was very, very convincing. In fact, I was, and he, he did it with, uh, with three different books. One of them has been published three or four times with different titles, and people are surprised that it doesn't catch on. It's not an easy read, but it's an important read, and that's Popper and After. But uh, um, after reading Stove, and it took me years to get through the, his work, I left perfectly convinced that... Uh, that science found its grounding, its logic in, in probability theory, but I thought that I should be able to then go into probability theory and find someone that had come to those same conclusions, and I had, in fact, and that was E.T. Jaynes. But I mentioned David Stove because his treatment of these um, philosophers um, should form the backbone of any correction or coherent uh, philosophy of science. 
It'd be nice to have a philosophy of science that, that didn't make scientists laugh. And what we currently have does. How pervasive is the popper coon Lakatos fire oven? Um, what Stove called the irrationalist. How how accepted or ingrained is their view? Well, Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions is the most cited work book in all of the academic literature, and Kuhn is cited uh, second only to uh, uh, Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, I think it is. Is that right? Was it Lenin? I think so. And so what, what Popper did was he, he didn't have a definition of science, which I found kind of troublesome, but he did offer a demarcation. And when you look up Karl Popper, he, it says he's most known for his demarcation. And in fact, his demarcation of falsification was built into, uh, is part of the Daubert decision um, of the US Supreme Court that uh, uh, describes, defines what it is to have a scientific standing in legal cases, in the law. And his, what, he, what he did is it was important to him that it be deductive, um, the basis for science. And he picked falsification because the, the plan was to use like a modus tollens, iter iterations of modus tollens to, to, to lead where you want to go. And that's the if P then Q as a premise, and I got a second premise of not Q, therefore not P. And, and this is deductive, and our null hypothesis uh, 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 testing, uh, statistic testing comes through this, uh, is related to that and justified. But anyways, he, it, it leads to a mathematics, an inferential mathematics, that recognizes the probability of data given the hypothesis but denies the meaning of the probability of a hypothesis, which strikes an arrow right through the heart of the, what is the, the chief uh, method of validation, the only method, the only way that we validate uh, a scientific model is through the probability of the hypothesis or the theory. And so in all of these things, the null hypothesis statistical testing protocol of Fisher, Name, and Pearson. It's a hybrid of their, of their approaches to inferential statistics. Um, it's, uh, this problem is, is only found in academia. And what I'm getting to here is that this is the science that won't replicate. It won't replicate, and there is no system of validation. And for reference on this, I don't think you can do better than to look at Trafamau and Briggs and Gigerenzer and some of the work that they did in conjunction with one another. Very, very powerful. This relates to the problem with p-values, which is, uh, there's more written on that than care to read. Um, and this science that won't replicate um, puts us in a position here. I'm going to go to the top board. I apologize for all the reading, but I didn't want to leave anything out. And I know I don't have much time. Um, the the deductive approach that denies the probability of the hypothesis and only looks at the probability of the, of the data given the hypothesis, the null hypothesis uh, testing, all of that leaves academic science with no measure, no metric for validation, and offers instead the implicit yet false replication, implication of validation through small p-values in publication in journals esteemed by consensus. The science won't replicate because it wasn't designed to. Even the recognition of a crisis, in quotes, in non-replicating science presupposes that it should replicate, suggesting an unspoken, maybe subconscious admission of the primacy of prediction in validating scientific models. You could say, why? what's the problem that it doesn't replicate? It's in the journal, it's in the high impact journal. It was cited an amazing number of times, right? And it had good p-values. What else are you looking for? Well, I tell you, to be, to be real, it needs to replicate. Um, what would this look like in, a, in terms of an offering? I suppose you need to guide students to what to look at. First of all, I, would, I wouldn't put much time into Popper, Kuhn, Lakatos, and Fire of it. I could skim their work quickly, even though they, they, they wrote way too much. 
but I would, I would fundamentally be able to dismiss them through the work of David Stove. And he's, he's, he's worth the study. This is not, and, and what, the point I'm making here is that Popper was dead wrong on the, on the falsification. Um, falsification, uh, I think the first time I saw that, I think it was A.J. Ayers, the, one of the logical uh, positives, well, his logical positive is in one of the Vienna school. I think that was his requirement for a, a, a meaningful assertion, that it had to be a testable, a testable concept, at least in theory, could be tested. And it keeps things from like seven angels to, to dancing on the head of a pin. It keeps that kind of thing from, from, from uh, having meaning. I accept. I accepted the, the, I would accept uh, 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 a demarcation of falsification if, if it were saying that that's a requirement for a meaningful statement, if it really, in the sense of a testable proposition. But it's, it's necessary for a scientific assertion or model, but it's not sufficient. That's the problem with it. Necessary, but not sufficient. And and what I would do instead is I would study Laplace, Jeffries, and Cox. And in E.T. James' masterwork, Probability Theory of the Logic of Science, he goes into considerable detail as to how these three people created a probability logic. And this, in fact, is much of the strength and core of what's known as a Bayesian inference today. So that's the replication crisis in a, in a nutshell right there. This is broken science. I don't think we're gonna fix it. I have no hopes of, of, of changing that system. Uh, there's too much money, too much power. Uh, it, would, it would require a major revamp. But again, I do believe that we can protect any man, not every man, any man, anyone's willing to listen and think. I think we can protect them from the tyranny of, of bad science and its purveyors. Thanks, we're done.